Hey, it's very nice to be here. And uh, to tell, I'll talk to you today about uh, quasi particles and quasi worlds. <clears throat> Uh, this is how it's going to go. I'll first tell you uh, what quasi-particles are. Probably most of you have a pretty good idea of what quasi-particles are, but we'll be coming at them from a special perspective that leads into the concept of quasi-worlds. And uh, they have an interesting history that you uh, may not be so familiar. Uh, and then I'll, uh, I'll get to uh, two case studies of quasi-particles and, and quasi-worlds. I'll talk about anions, which uh, have been a very interesting subject in condensed matter physics uh, that's had thousands of theoretical papers and now is starting to have an experimental literature and may even be important in technology. And then I'll talk about another case study, axions, where uh, these concept you'll see how versatile these concepts are. And then I'll talk about where the subject may be going in the future. I'll point out a, a direction that I think ha has a great future, but at, at present is still uh, getting born. So let's start with some history. I like to ground its physics in its history. It's wonderful to commune with great minds and also see how things might have been different. And the uh, first kind of uh, quasi-particle, I would say, to be introduced it was by, as, as with so many things in physics, associated with Albert Einstein. Famously, in 1905, he introduced the concept of a photon. Well, it didn't have the name photon at that time. That came later. It was called the light quantum. And this is eventually the contribution for which he won a Nobel Prize, not for relativity. In 1907, two years later, he made a contribution which I think is also extremely profound, but perhaps less known. Uh, that is, he, he introduced the, concept, the first real quasi-particle, uh, the, the phonon. These proposals for these new particles, the particle that's usually thought of as a particle, the photon, and uh, the, the phonon, are closely related conceptually, but it was very bold at that time to think of particles in empty space on the same footing as emergent particles within materials. So Einstein's proposals were in, for the phonon were, uh, or, and photon were both based on uh, the same kind of problem. That's that in the thermodynamics of vibrations of two different things. One of them, the ether, or electric and magnetic fields in empty space, uh, and the other uh, in crystals, both had problems when you tried to treat them within the framework of uh, statistical mechanics. So in the case of electromagnetism, you have vibra vibrations in electric and magnetic fields, and uh, if you heat up space, if you bring it into thermal equilibrium, bring these fields into thermal equilibrium, uh, you can study what their thermodynamic properties are. And similarly, uh, you have vibrations in a crystal like silicon, and you can, uh, according to the rules of classical mechanics, uh, figure out what their th thermodynamic properties should be. And in both cases, there was a severe experimental problem. Uh, the calculations based on classical statistical mechanics don't work. In both cases, there's an excess predicted uh, over experiment uh, of vibrations of very high frequency but very low momentum, the so-called ultraviolet catastrophe. 
And what Einstein proposed is that uh, those kinds of uh, vibrations uh, can't be, they, the amplitudes can't be arbitrarily small, that you have quanta, so there's a limitation, and that solved this problem and uh, allowed a reconciliation of the statistical mechanical principles with observations, but made the bold prediction that uh, these, that you had a new, new kinds of particles. And by now, phonons have become a field of study in themselves and, and are very much a recognized kind of emergent particle, as well, of course, as photons. <clears throat> It's worth mentioning that photons can also become qualitatively different particles with emergent properties inside materials. So photons, like many other particles, can have their properties changed when they propagate inside materials. And a striking example of this, excuse me, A striking example of this is that the essence of superconductivity can be understood as a qualitative change in the properties of photons inside superconductors, namely that instead of having zero mass, which they have outside of superconductors, within the superconductor, the photon acquires a finite mass. And all the main properties of superconductors follow from this observation. For instance, the Meissner effect is a dramatic experimental uh, manifestation of the fact that the photons outside a superconductor don't match the photons inside. And so a photon that, uh, uh, on a magnetic field that's incident on the superconductor has a hard time getting in. So that was sort of the original quasi-particle. Now uh, let me introduce a quasi-particle which really makes the modern world. Here's a picture that I love. Uh, when I look, look for pictures of uh, physicists involved in making holes, the, this, this, this came up and it shows the three main uh, uh, theoretical contributors to that endeavor. Uh, uh, Paul Dirac on the left, uh, Wolfgang Pauli in the middle, and uh, Rudolf Peierls on the right, at, at facing, at facing in your direction. Okay. So these three gentlemen introduced holes in different contexts. Uh, Dirac introduced the concept of holes in empty space, holes in the in the uh, in the in the uh, 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 circle of ideas I'm talking about here. So these are not black holes or ditches; these are holes in a special sense, as well, which I'll elaborate. Uh, holes in atoms, the original uh, concepts that there could be absence of a particle that behaves like a different kind of particle, uh, was introduced with, in, by, by Wolfgang Pauli in studies of atoms and molecules. And then finally, Rudolf Peierls used these ideas in the understanding of the quantum mechanical understanding of materials, especially metals and semiconductors, and developed holes that, uh, that as you'll see, become a dominant part of modern life and their role is increasing all the time. <laughs> so uh, here's a basic uh, concept, uh, the basic uh, mechanism of producing holes, or actually uh, uh, holes connected with uh, also particles. Uh, this is, it, it's, although it's the latest to develop, in some ways it's the easier to, easiest to picture what goes on inside a material as opposed to an atom or empty space. Inside a material, you have lots of electrons. And what happens if you inject, electro, uh, inject energy into the system 
and pluck an electron out of where it wants to be. Well, uh, what happens in many kinds of materials is that they settle down. Okay, they may have to radiate. If you were sloppy about how you plucked, plucked out the electron, uh, they may have to radiate it a little bit. But they settle down into a reproducible concentration of energy with uh, definite properties that can also move around. So from the point of view of an observer inside the material, they look like a kind of particle. Okay. Uh, these particle, these holes are uh, positively charged because they represent the absence of an electron. So they have the same electric charge as protons, but they're much cheaper to produce. They're much more mobile because they're lighter and they're much more versatile because you can make them in all kinds of materials uh, than, than protons. And so they allowed new kinds of engineering that have, as I already advertised, made the modern world. So for instance, one thing you can do is if you produce, liberate an electron and leave behind a hole and have an electric field applied, those will move in opposite directions. And so the energy that made this uh, excitation has now been transformed into electric energy. And this is a way that you can turn uh, solar energy into electrical energy. And electrical energy is beautiful energy because it's transportable. So we know how to do all kinds of things with electric energy. And the sun is generous enough to present to uh, rain down on Earth about 10,000 times as much energy as humans presently use. And if, if we can uh, manage to produce these quasi pairs on an industrial scale, uh, they will give us clean, sustainable energy on a grand scale into the future. So now let me move to quasi worlds. The idea that the world could be considered as a material, that apparently empty space could be considered as a material, uh, goes back, goes way back, it was uh, to the ancient Greeks and so, and was actually something that people had to unlearn with Isaac Newton, who made space really empty in his laws. It was very good to have space as just kind of an empty platform of a void. But, uh, James Clerk Maxwell, in trying to understand the phenomena of electricity and magnetism, inspired by the intuitive work and pictures of Michael Faraday, uh, filled space with stuff. <laughs> he wanted to check that he could make a model of electric and magnetic energy flows and phenomena that was consistent with all the basic principles of mechanics and so he made a mechanical embodiment of the laws that, know, that were known at that time. It had little uh, flywheels and gears and things. It's very ingenious if you study it. And uh, modern students of metamaterials could learn a lot from Maxwell, even to this day. But uh, this model led him to a slight, when he, when he worked out all its consequences, he found, first of all, that it's the, the model supported propagation of electromagnetic radiation, now known as, well, electromagnetic radiation, and that it propagated at the speed of light. And he identified, he proposed that this was light. And uh, he had to, to add a phenomena, the displacement current, which wasn't in the laws at that time. Maxwell was extremely inspired by his discovery, and this, I, I just want to read this because it's such an extraordinary statement. The vast interplanetary and interstellar regions will no longer be regarded as waste places in the universe, which the creator has not seen fit to fill with the symbols of the manifold order of his kingdom. We shall find them to be already full of this wonderful medium, so full that no human power can remove it from the smallest portion of space or produce the slightest flaw in its infinite continuity. So the idea that space itself is a material is something that uh, Maxwell found, found 
awesome and inspiring, and he was a believing Christian, and he, somehow this also uh, tied up with his uh, religious beliefs. Uh, and I think we can still find it quite inspiring uh, to think of, of empty space as a material. And there are many other ways to get to the understanding that empty space is fruitfully regarded as a material. Uh, I showed you how inside actual materials you can understand uh, production of positive, of whole particle pairs, elect liberated electrons and also holes uh, by a photon. Uh, Dirac, in interpreting his equation, which was uh, very problematic when he tried to make a relativistic version of, uh, of the Schrodinger equation, uh, was able by making a model of empty space as being a material filled with the so-called Dirac C of electrons to use a very similar kind of picture to predict that photons in empty space, so-called empty space, would also produce pairs. And sure enough, the, the, that, that's, that's what we can see in, in bubble chambers and cloud chambers and is a very common thing now in, uh, in the study of high energy or by now what's called low energy physics. <laughs> and perhaps most dramatic recently, most dramatic of all, uh, space-time itself can warp and vibrate. So uh, even when there's no, nothing you'd, you'd be tempted to call a particle out there, so in pure vacuum, the space and time in themselves can vibrate, uh, and that gives, that, that's gravitational waves. This was a prediction, of course, of Einstein's general theory of relativity. Uh, black holes warp space, that's, that's how they exert their gravity, and when they end spiral, the, the warps get all mixed up and radiate light. And uh, if, you're, if you work hard and use all the resources of modern technology, you can just barely the detect the uh, result of two gigantic black holes merging and liberating enormous amounts of their mass energy as gravitational radiation. So very much uh, the idea that very much consistent with and almost forcing the idea that so-called empty space is a material. It can vibrate, you can pluck things out of it, and you, and, uh, and you can get good new equations by thinking about space and time, ab about empty space as a material. We'll see more of that uh, shortly. <clears throat> you can also think of materials as worlds. Uh, Suppose you want to make a world where there are lots of holes. So instead of having the world based on protons as the positive charged characters, you make a world where there are lots of holes. And you can do that by doping your material in, uh, in, in, by re replacing silicon, if silicon is your perfect substrate, so that's your empty space, so to speak, if you were silicon-based life inside the material, inside the, uh, a crystal, uh, with a material that doesn't have as many electrons as, it's, as it should. So put a boron atom where a silicon atom should be, and it makes it chemically induces a hole. And if you do lots of that, you can make clever arrangements where the positive and negative charges kind of act like dams and troughs and can direct the flows of currents and be guided by uh, uh, little fields in order to do useful things. And by superposing a world that's rich in holes with rich worlds that are rich in uh, electrons, you can make uh, transistors, which, and if you make a lot of transistors, you change the world, and that's... People have been guided by these principles uh, to think of new kinds of worlds where, uh, at a technical level, you write down candidate field theories, either classical or uh, quantum, and see whether those field theories 
can be embodied in actual materials. So they give candidate worlds. If you, if you, we know how to make worlds that are consistent with the basic principles and have different alternative kinds of quasi-particles and behaviors. This has been very, very fruitful in many ways. Uh, I'll just show you one that's particularly striking visually. Liquid crystals are materials that uh, sort of were designed, partially designed theoretically, partially uh, sculpted empirically, to ha and they have uh, molecular patterns of ordering that you can treat using the methods of field theory and get very non-trivial understanding of. And because the patterns in liquid crystals are roughly on the scale of visible light, these irregularities or patterns in the, in the liquid crystal uh, make beautiful aesthetic objects sometimes and can actually be used also for display purposes. And understanding these worlds, these quasi-worlds, uh, you can predict the nature of phase transitions, you can make designer worlds with desirable properties. And that's the story of liquid crystals. So now I'd like to go to today's frontiers and talk about how these ideas are driving uh, ideas, driving new ideas and uh, new kinds of experiments and even perhaps new kinds of technologies and even perhaps uh, understanding something about cosmology. <clears throat> so I'll first talk about anions. Anions are particles of a qualitatively new kind, they have a qualitatively new feature, the quasi particle, the quasi particles with memory, with a kind of memory. Okay. So to describe this kind of memory, which is topological, I need to, to tell you what, what the objects are that, that carry the topology. So the objects that are relevant are the world lines of the particles or the quasi-particles. So very much like holes, they're things that you get by plucking electrons out of suitable materials or doing other kinds of operations, applying magnetic fields, for instance. But in any case, they're localized kinds of excitations within materials that have reproducible properties and can move. So they are particles, emergent particles, and they can have very different uh, properties than uh, particles in empty space. Now, to get to any ions, uh, we should introduce the concept of world lines. Any ions, it turns out, uh, naturally live in two-dimensional worlds, so in two-dimensional materials. And uh, if you look at the behavior of a, an assembly of quasi-particles, so um, an assembly of uh, anions, and its behavior in time, as the particles move around, uh, you trace paths, so they have a position as a function of time, and that makes, if you regard time as another dimension, so let, let, let's make it vertical here, then uh, these look like uh, lines going up, like little strands of spaghetti going up, uh, and you can make them at a certain time, destroy them at another time. In between, you get a kind of mash of spaghetti. <clears throat> so this, these are the world lines and the paths, of, the paths of the particles in time can be visualized as paths in a three-dimensional space, Lo lines or strings or whatever you want to call them. And uh, the big, if you have a two-dimensional thing and uh, the time is the third dimension, altogether you have a three-dimensional space and the topology of world lines getting entangled is like the topology of braids of hair getting entangled or basically knots in three dimensions, which are not trivial. The reason you need anions only in two dimensions is that knots in four dimension can always be untied trivially. I'll leave that as an exercise for you to, to, tell, to, to see why. <clears throat> But braids can get very complicated, and it's important that they are stable topologically because 
Otherwise, they wouldn't be very useful arrangements of hair. They would, if you nodded your head, they would come undone, or in the wind, they'd come undone, and all the trouble in making these beautiful patterns would not be stable. But all you have to do to make the braid stable is tie it at the end, and then it doesn't come undone. <coughs> That's topology, applied topology. Right. <laughs> now, long ago, uh, the Mesoamerican civilizations, the Inca in, in particular, for a long time used, used the uh, properties of topology in three dimensions as a kind of language. This is called quipu. And that does not mean quantum ipu. <laughs> Just happens to be the happens to be the name of this technique, and uh, the, it was a robust nonverbal language that could be very rich. This is showing some numerical uh, dis, uh, storage of information in knots. You can have different kinds of knots. Okay, you can, uh, and you can, as you can see, this that you also can have knots that branch branch off. You can you have a whole full three dimensional topology. You can also have different colors of st strands. And uh, these can be reasonably portable. They don't require industries that produce paper, which were not available up in the mountains of the Andes. And uh, this was the way things were done and still are in, in some remote corners of, uh, of Mesoamerica. So you can store a lot of information stably inside patterns of knots. And anions, that's what they do. <laughs> but, but where is the info? There's no, okay, so these are actually particles moving around in two-dimensional materials. You, so you don't, have the, you don't have these strands in physical space, but what you do have is their quantum mechanical wave functions. And their quantum mechanical wave functions reflect the motion that they've gone through. So that's what we mean by saying that they have a memory. They have a very non-trivial record in their wave functions of the motions they've gone through. And so you can imagine by cleverly orchestrating the motions, you can uh, store, store and process information. And that turns out to be true. <laughs> okay. And and the, the uh, remarkable thing is that, and really characteristic of anions, but I won't be able to really justify this, is that the, the wave functions keep track of the topology of how the world lines have been wrapping around each other. They're independent of the details, which, as you'll see, is very important. <clears throat> and that's... So in 1984, I predicted that the stable concentrations the con of energy, the quasi-particles within certain two-dimensional quasi-worlds, the so-called quantum Hall liquids, would be anions, would have this kind of topological memory. Here's the paper. And at the time, I thought that this would be checked and, of course, verified <laughs> within a few months. Uh, instead, it took almost 40 years but worth waiting for, I think. <laughs> uh, here's the, the uh, uh, breakthrough paper as far as seeing that you had a memory based on uh, t uh, the topology of uh, uh, quasi-particles in the quantum Hall effect wrapping around one another. And here's, uh, here's a uh, more uh, graphic uh, uh, predict, uh, uh, illustration, uh, uh, presentation of what the, what the experiment was. Uh, so you have a two-dimensional quantum liquid, the quantum Hall liquid, that's in the blue regions there. And then you have electrical probes, which allow you to, uh, because the anions in this system are electrically charged, you can also move them around. 
uh, using, manipulate them using electric fields. And the basic, yeah, I'll use this one. The basic uh, measurement is extremely simple. You want to have a current here and measure, and, uh, measure how much current comes out of how much current flows. You put in a current and you want to see, uh, or you, you put in a source and see how much current flows as you change the magnetic uh, field. And uh, a special feature of the quantum Hall liquids is that the particles only move in uh, one direction, so here only clockwise. And with the probe, and, uh, and the current only flows along the boundaries, it turns out. And if you've got this kind of setup, there are two places where the current can uh, go from the top to the bottom. These two here that are difficult to bridge. So basically the current gets contributions from ones that bridge it here and ones that bridge it there. And you don't really have to worry about multiple uh, bridgings very much. And if you think about it, the quasi-particles which flow around here versus the ones that flow around here wrap around the other anions in the middle uh, in different ways. Okay, the topology is different whether you surround, you go over the top or uh, down the bottom. Uh, one way of thinking about that is thinking about first going over the top and then going the bottom, so the, following the inverse of the path uh, on the bottom, and you'll see you've made a circle all around the stuff in, in the middle. So the prediction is that depending on how many part quasi-particles are in the middle, because uh, you will have uh, wrapped different numbers of times, uh, you wrapped uh, either one more, either wrapped or not wrapped around them, uh, they will alter the wave function of currents that go through the top versus currents that go through the bottom, and they will change the interference pattern that you have when you add up the contributions of those currents. So that's the basic idea. Okay. Okay. I see some interested faces, some slightly bewildered faces, but if you want to ask a question, this would be, might be a good time. Okay. Anyway, we'll let it settle in. <laughs> and so the experiment is you change the number of quasi particles in the middle and see what happens. And you can change the number of quasi-particles in the middle by slightly adjusting the magnetic field to which this whole thing is uh, subject. And you should find jumps whenever a new anion enters the middle. And you can predict when that's going to happen and the effect it's going to have. And it's quite beautiful. Yeah, so this is one of, to me, of course, I'm prejudiced, but this is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen as an, ex an experiment in physics. Uh, and you can predict the magnitude of the jumps and where they occur, and it's very nice. Now, now, uh, in the future, I'm hoping, and so are the people involved in this experiment, that now that you know sort of what you need to do, to make this up. You have to make the material very pure, you have to screen out the field, various technical issues that, had, that turned out to be crucial. Once you know how to do it, it should be much easier to reproduce and make, product, make progress on uh, exploring the implications. And, other, and, and those of you who know about the, fr the fractional quantum Hall effect know that there are many, many liquids of these kinds that are uh, related but distinct. So they predict different kinds of anions. This is just the simplest one. One can also manufacture anions. So pioneering kind of demonstration experiments were done uh, by some of my friends in China back in 2016. And I certainly won't 
uh, go into the, the the detailed analysis of what it is, but it's it's a uh, uh, it's an artificial system. Obviously, it's a, a kind of circuit involving superconductors, and it turns out that that you, if you make quasi particles by having uh, either little bits of extra charge in, in, in it or having little circulating currents going around. And if, if you wind the, the circulating current around, the, around the, the defects in charge, you get uh, topological modifications of the wave function, uh, modifications of the wave function that depend on topology. <clears throat> This has inspired a vision, these developments, this. That is that, as I said, you can store a lot of information in braids. And the great difficulty from an engineering perspective in quantum computing is that quantum information is very delicate. Okay. The kinds of correlations that encode quantum information uh, are easily disturbed by the outside world by small disturbances. And the thing about topology is that if you make only small, divert, small uh, perturbations, you don't change the topology. So here, if you see, if you introduce some jiggling here, it doesn't change the nature of the braid, the topological nature. So this kind of information storage and this kind of information processing based on any ions is intrinsically immune from many classes of noise. And then, of course, it's not trivial to read out the information. It's, heavily, it's encoded in these wave functions, which you have to get at by moving things around. But uh, it's sufficiently promising that Microsoft has invested very heavily in pursuing this and just recently in March of uh, 2022, uh, well you can read it for yourself, they, they've made the kinds of enions that are sufficiently complicated. These are no longer based on the quantum Hall effect, they're, uh, they're based on kind of art of, uh, uh, engineered structures involving superconducting wires on magnetic substrates. It's very uh, tricky, but, but they, they, it's something that could in principle be scaled up and support rich enough kinds of information to do uh, use, to be a, a platform for universal quantum computing. So, Microsoft is well. This is, of course, the press release, but they are they are uh, uh, promising a uh, a new generation of as yet unimagined computing capabilities for Azure companies. Azure, Azure is Microsoft's quantum computing in a, initiative. Uh, yeah, and well, I'd be satisfied if they if they uh, if they did some of the so already imagined. Uh, applications of quantum computing, but we'll see. <laughs> okay, so that's one example of how these ideas about materials supporting worlds and those worlds having particles that uh, have uh, different properties than the particles we meet in our em so-called empty space, how it's been fruitful. Let me show you another one where the idea has actually in different forms, uh, uh, been fruitful in two ways. This is the domain of axions. I'll give you a lightning introduction to axions. I really don't want to abuse your patience. Uh, so the, motiva the original motivation for axions was to, uh, for, uh, to address a conceptual aesthetic problem in the foundations of the standard model. Basically, the standard model has a beautiful match between the interactions that are allowed by general principles, that is, by the general principles of uh, uh, special relativity and quantum mechanics, as embodied in quantum field theory, and local symmetry, which is the secret sauce of the standard model that governs how the different interactions work, it turns out. Uh, if you impose those 
conditions, uh, you find that the possibilities for the interactions of the particles, the fundamental particles that have been discovered, are very, very restricted. Okay. Yeah. Quantum field theories uh, are very uh, delicate objects. They're prone to produce infinities and nonsense if you try to make things inter interact uh, in uh, inappropriate ways. And so the, the, the things that actually can be done are very, very restricted. And, uh, <clears throat> and there's a beautiful match between what's allowed by these general principles and what actually happens in the world, with one exception. One exception. Uh, there's a possible interaction that violates among uh, the colored gluons that appear in the theory of the strong interaction, a possible interaction which violates the symmetry between the laws running forward in time and the and laws running backward in time in, in a big way. Okay. Whereas, and whereas nature seems to respect that symmetry. So this interaction does not in fact occur. Okay. The, the kind of evidence for the fact that it does not occur is the following. Uh, you can predict, that you can calculate, if the interaction were present, that uh, it would allow neutrons and other uh, particles to have electric dipole moments, but electric dipole mom fundamental particles have been looked at very hard to see if they have electric dipole moments. Let me remind you that the study of magnetic dipole moments of elementary particles is a rich field that's highly developed and uh, has a long history, a long fruitful history. It was the way the first element, first uh, evidence for modern quantum electrodynamics was there, and 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 uh, so forth. Uh, but anyway, the electric dipole moments have, despite enormous efforts and very ingenious experiments to look for them, have never been observed at a non-zero value. And the, the way we understand that is that the laws, the relevant laws, are highly accurate under reversal of time. That would explain the absence of the electric dipole moment, because the electric dipole moment would be a correlation between uh, an electric field, which you, know, the, you have to imagine an electric field going out, and, and the spin of the particle. But the spin of the particle reverses under time reversal and the electric field does not. So it's, uh, it, such, an elect such a dipole moment would uh, violate time reversal symmetry. It doesn't occur, and that's an argument that gives a strong argument that can be made quantitative that this interaction among the colored gluons does not occur, or rather that its strength is less than a part in 10 billion of the sort of strength you would expect by dimensional analysis. So that's a striking, uh, irritating feature of the standard model, which is otherwise so beautiful that it, it allows, it, it, it predicts precisely all the interactions that occur, but allows, but uh, also would allow one more that doesn't occur. <laughs> Why? The effort to understand this has had, uh, of course, a very long history too, so really since the earliest days of the standard model. Uh, but the only idea that really has stood the test of time is that uh, introduces the idea that this coupling has evolved with time. And that's very much in the spirit of quasi-worlds. That is, if space can be thought of as a material, the material is governed by what's in it, and what's in it can change with time. And in this case, what you need is a field that can evolve with time. 
and it turns out a very modest and uh, disciplined extension of the standard model gives you a setup where you have a field, a complex number field, so it has both a magnitude and uh, an angle or phase that uh, has its energetic minimum at a place where that interaction vanishes, so it likes to have a time reversal symmetric value, that's a special value that's energetically favorable, uh, so it wants to settle down there and therefore uh, if it does settle down there accurately enough, that would explain why the coupling is small. <laughs> okay, this, it can adjust, it can evolve with time because this field that fills all space can adjust and it wants to make, it wants to adjust, it wants to move in such a way that it cancels off the potential interaction. Oh, I don't know why I have this, this, no, okay. So, the, now all, all this is within the framework of quantum field theory, so the, the, this field is a quantum field, and it's, just as Einstein taught us, quantum fields produce particles, and uh, the particles that are involved in this are called axions, which I named after this laundry detergent because it solves, it cleans up a problem with the axial current, it turns out. And so on. Well, that's what I told the uh, editors. I just like the name. Anyway. Now, completely unrelated to that, as a, uh, a, a stream of scientific investigation and mystery, was something that astronomers observed, which is shown in this uh, picture, and explained here, that is that when you look at distant objects that are behind clusters of galaxies, you often find multiple images. And the interpretation is that the light has been, from the distant object, has been bent so that it can arrive at, 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 a, at the observation on Earth in different ways. So it appears like several objects. Each, each path gives its own image. I'm, I'm not seeing exactly the slides I expect to see, so something... No, I guess it's okay. This is just my mind that's flawed. Okay. There's the, uh, So, it turns out that we have this field that wants to get to zero, wants to get to the place where this interaction vanishes, wants to, to minimize its energy, and it does a very good job of that. So it does solve the problem instead of a part, it gives a residual interaction which is like 10 to the minus 14th instead of the minus 10, 10 to the minus 10th is bigger, so it's okay. <laughs> the, uh, but the fields involved are very, very stiff, so it, if the fact that they don't quite settle down to zero can represent enormous amounts of energy. And if you just, the theory wasn't in, invented with that, in, with the dark matter problem in, in mind, but it turns out that if you run the equations of axion physics through cosmology, there's residual energy in those oscillations at the end, which is the right amount and has the right properties to supply the dark matter that the, ax that the astronomers have found that they need. So, very intriguing situation, and scientists in, in this and related fields uh, want, are going to great length <laughs> to test whether, in fact, this hypothesis is correct. So here's a, uh, a Nordic scientist, very tall, uh, to show the scale of the so-called EAXO project at CERN. Uh, this is a project that's supposed to be, that's uh, testing the hypothesis that axions are emitted by the sun. 
the signal, the axions interact very, very weakly, so you have to have a big detector to get them, and and uh, and uh, you want to always be pointing at the sun again because the signal is so weak. You need, and you want to see, uh, you, you want to, if you have a signal, you want to be sure it's associated with the sun, and so, uh, and you want to collect as much time as you can. So you have this gigantic thing that uh, wants to move around. And this is a serious proposal that's being built. <laughs> now, you can uh, run the equations through cosmology, as I mentioned, and see at what value of the parameters of the axion theory. I should have mentioned the axion theory is basically a one parameter theory. So we, once you know the mass of the axion, you know everything else, but we don't know the mass. So that's unfortunate. <laughs> uh, however, uh, there's only uh, a limited range of masses for which the cosmological production matches the dark matter density. So, uh, and over the years, these estimates have gotten more and more precise, and so that now there's a, a fairly small, uh, well, still fairly large, but also could be worse, uh, interval of uh, masses that uh, seem to do that job. <clears throat> or have it, and those are the masses, and they correspond to this. If you co uh, convert uh, energies or mass into frequency, which is useful for experimental purposes, as you'll see, it corresponds to 10 to 45 gigahertz. <clears throat> So here's uh, a present, a, a uh, an accounting of the many, many kinds of observations and experiments that have been done to test the uh, axion hypothesis over the years, and continuing very much to this day. All, I think all of these experiments are, are active, but this is where the prediction is. This band here. And this is the uh, this is the uh, I said it's a one parameter theory. It's not quite a one parameter theory. There's a band, and there's also some uncertainty in the calculations. So this would be the region where uh, you would be testing the axion theory. So you need you really need to detect signals in here, and none of the experiments do that <laughs> yet. They're either in the wrong place or not sensitive enough. But a couple of years ago, we had a bright idea that might do it. Uh, and this is, it was literally inspired by thinking about quasi-worlds, uh, namely effective Lagrangians as a technical tool. <laughs> and uh, we designed a quasi-world, which is a kind of a metamaterial, an artificial world where in which the quasi-photons have exactly the same quantum numbers and other properties as axions, and therefore can resonantly convert, into, or the axions can resonantly convert if they exist into these quasi-photons, and then you can read them out uh, using uh, uh, the, the techniques of experimental physics. <laughs> and uh, the... So this is the prototype design. This is a prototype. There are now several different prototypes. It seems to work better than advertised. We have nicer looking prototypes now. And uh, this is what we think we can do. And this is that, that mass region. So we think, well, in fact, since this graph was made, we got our hands on a nice big magnet, so we can probably, and, and the prototypes are working better than expected, so probably we, this was conservative. But we, we think we have a very good shot at uh, detecting this, <clears throat> if it exists. Okay. So, quo vadis, what's next? When I've talked about quasi-particles so far, they've had various properties. They've had spin, 
electric charge, uh, mass, and with any ions, you also have this kind of exotic memory. But another property that hasn't been dis uh, in quasi-particles to date, that's a very f important feature of the world and can give us models of new kinds of things, is self-reproduction. I mean, you and I are made of quasi-particles that self-reproduce <laughs> cells. <laughs> Uh, and that's a very powerful idea. It allows you to go from puny cells at the beginning to impressive organisms. <clears throat> People starting with John von Neumann have thought about building things that are simpler than cells, so you actually have a realistic chance of making them, and yet have rich enough properties to do self-reproduction and uh, and tap into that extraordinarily powerful uh, idea. So this, this was, uh, I won't go into the details of this, but this was von Neumann's uh, original design of a cellular automaton that uh, could, could self-reproduce and also take instructions to make, make things and, and self-reproduce. <laughs> so. I think a very powerful idea that so far has not led to a powerful branch of engineering, but I think it should and will. Yeah, there. And if you have quasi particles, quasi cells, quasi particles that can also self reproduce, then you can make quasi organisms. <clears throat> so the, the, that would be as in embryos uh, and, and in uh, these kind of engineering projects would be self-reproduction with programmed variation. You also have self-reproduction with natural variation. This is something we have in physics already in a, a simple way uh, with cosmic ray showers, also chain reactions where you start with a primary thing and then you, it interacts in, and, and produces more things. So if you think about this is a kind of self-reproduction with variation and if you, this looks like a pandemic, <laughs> it has the properties of exponential growth and uh, sort of looks threatening like a pandemic. <laughs> But it could also be the tree of life. <laughs> right. This is just the same thing upside down, where uh, spontaneous variations uh, in things that support self-reproduction by, <laughs> by uh, with variations. But you can change the program a little bit, and you get things that are called uh, plants, animals, different species of life. <laughs> okay. So to close this conceptualization of what the future of quasi-particles and quasi-worlds look like, let me talk about quasi-multiverses. The multiverse is a popular subject of speculation these days. Uh, the idea that far, far away, so far unseen, there are regions of physical reality that obey different laws and look quite different from uh, the, the laws that we see around us so far in our universe and our survey of cosmology. But here's a quasi-multiverse. <laughs> if you think about Different kinds of materials, as I've been advocating, as kind of worlds in themselves with their own laws, their own particles, then if you have mixed interfaces of those, uh, you've made a multiverse, a quasi-multiverse. These quasi-worlds have become a quasi-multiverse. To me, this makes the idea, well, combined with the idea that our world should be considered as a material, makes the idea of the multiverse itself much more plausible. What could be more, what could be more natural if you have uh, the world being a material than to have other parts of, other states of the material nearby? <clears throat> and 
thinking about not just single new worlds that you can make using different kinds of quasi-particles and change their properties, but putting them next to each other in ways that ha enhance their properties is something that, as you've seen, can be very, very useful. And uh, using these methods of analysis that we've developed, uh, effective field theory, theories with boundary, and what happens at the boundary, uh, you, that, that takes the potential of these ideas to a higher level. So with that, I hope you find quasi-worlds where you can have fun living in the future, too. All right, bye now. So that's, that's, that's it for today. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you for this um, beautiful and fascinating talk. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you were showing these uh, experiments on uh, onions on the on the two deck uh, by Manfra et yes. al. And then you showed that these jumps of this phase are something that you want to see yes. there. And I, I saw that they were kind of uh, around one third of two pi or something like that, yes. but not cons completely constant. So does this tell something and should they be one third or? What yes, they should be. That, th that's what they should be. Yeah, I mean, and uh, so it's just experimental noise that it's. Uh, I think so, and that's what they. they yeah, they certainly interpret it as dirt. And I should say, this is not the most recent data. In a later paper, you, they have cleaner-looking data, actually. So, yeah. But isn't is I mean, yeah, it does it does wiggle around a little bit. Uh, well, but but their fits don't. <laughs> you can see the black bars are their fits, and their. Uh, where, where does one third come but, from? So where, it's where it's how should I say it's not uh, uh, there. You know the, the there's a, you know, this should be 0 0.33 experimentally or minus 0 0.33, and you see there's some scatter, and uh, the experiment is not perfect. The materials are not perfect. I'm not sure they really understand all the sources of noise, but in the paper they do analyze lots of sources of noise, and th this is certainly well within uh, the uh, tolerance of, of, and sensitivity of their experiment. Yeah. And as I said, a late, there's a follow, there's a, there are later papers where this is considerably cleaner. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. So a few years ago, there were several experiments with uh, shining light through a wall to find axions. Yeah. Um, but you didn't talk about these experiments. Uh, they're probably on that graph somewhere. Let's see. <laughs> okay. So were these experiments a, an experimental dead end, or did we learn something from them? Well, we learned that axions with the properties they tried to find don't exist. That's, uh, but they, they, as I said, it's a one-parameter theory. And those experiments, see, they correspond to, uh, they might even be these experiments, but they correspond to uh, uh, very, uh, by standards of what's allowed, sort of high mass values where the axions wouldn't actually, would not uh, be abundant enough to make the dark matter. So it's there, it's certainly theoretically possible, but that, so the, but but basically, I, I'm not sure it's oh cast cast is that experiment, or cast was the early version of that experiment. The EAXO is a follow up on cast, which will go a little de go, go deeper here. So it will start to uh, probe things that are consistent with solving the uh, elementary particle problem, but it wouldn't give the dark matter. The dark matter, as I was, was this band here. So it's it's it's, but that's what they ruled out. They've ruled out some 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 band of parameters around here. Okay, so I'm wondering with this distinction between 
quasi particles and real particles. Do we somehow still have to be very careful with that? I mean, you showed the example. No, no, I think we should abolish it. I mean, the quasi quasi particles are particles, and particles are quasi particles. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think I think make uh, we use the same theoretical techniques to describe them, and it's been ex that, that's my big message today. It's, it's been extremely fruitful to think of them in the same ways. It's suggested new kind because the laws are can, can be very constraining. They suggest uh, if, if you find interesting things within these constraints, it can suggest new kinds of materials to look for, new kinds of properties that materials might have. Yeah. Okay, thanks, so. And vice versa, I guess you could imagine learning things from materials that uh, you take over into a description of, of uh, so called elementary particles. Right. That's well, that's happened at a high, higher level, like, like for instance, uh, ideas about renormalization group got certainly fertilized by, uh, uh, by condensed matter physics and critical phenomena. Uh, yeah. And I should say, I mean, it's not widely known in the uh, high energy community, in my experience, but the uh, People who studied quasi crystals, I'm not, I'm sorry, not quasi, liquid crystals, have been using topology in very sophisticated ways for a long time. And it's a very, very beautiful subject. And uh, in many ways, they, they went much further with it than, 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 than the, the particle physicists were. And, and well, the trouble is, particle physics has uh, a very, is very uh, constrained in its experimental methods. This is a caricature, and I don't want to offend people, but basically what you do is you crash things together and see what comes out. <laughs> so there's, there's not a lot of control, whereas in condensed matter physics, you can do all kinds of things. And so the quantum field theorists have done uh, all kinds of ingenious studies within uh, within this field of topology and uh, the the experimental uh, consequences have been rather limited and in well I shouldn't say limited but indirect I mean so for instance this uh, I didn't go into it but the whole the background of this so-called theta problem with the gluon self interaction in QCD very much has topology in the background uh, and yeah but but for instance in condensed matter physics you have actual flux tubes and, and superconductors, and you have all kinds of topological excitations in, uh, in liquid crystals that support a very rich phenomenology that particle physicists can only look on with envy and awe, right? <laughs> oh, and liquid helium-3 also, of course, I <laughs> should say. Right. So yeah. I have a question about the action experiment. What if we don't find anything there in the window where we expect to do something? And does it have implications as well on the, the quantum field theory side? Yeah, well, uh, this I think it's fair to say that the axion hypothesis is sufficiently well motivated and uh, sufficiently unique in addressing the, the problem it was meant to address, that not finding it would be very significant. Well, uh, not, as ex not as significant as finding it, but still it would be <laughs> an important thing to know. And then, I don't know, I, I'd have a good cry, I guess, and then try to think of something else. I don't, <laughs> I don't but the, you know, people have been trying, you know, people, it, it, people have been trying to develop alternatives for more than 40 years now, and nothing, nothing has really worked very well, theoretically. So, yeah. <laughs> More questions?
Yeah, this is this is an easy one. You showed this picture, this figure that you said von Neumann invented. Is that a real thing? I mean, yes. is that a real design for something? Oh yes, it's a very detailed design. <laughs> there, you can read this marvelous. Uh, well, von Neumann was working on this when he died. He died at a relatively uh, a fairly young age, uh, but his manuscripts were collected and pieced together into a, a machine. Uh, a uh, a book called The Theory of Self-Reproducing Machines, I think, or, or Self-Reproducing Automata. And then if, if you do a Google search on von Neumann self-replication, you'll see that there have been expositions of the ideas and cleaning up the ideas since. And nowadays, uh, you, can, you can put cellular automata on your computer that, that do these things. If you have a pretty good computer, otherwise it's going to be really slow and messy. But, but the, the, yeah, you, the, the, the designs work at the level of cellular automata. Now, the great challenge is go, you know, going from there to uh, physical objects that, that embody these principles. Sort of, let me go back to von Neumann. Von Neumann originally wanted to make physical objects that, that did it. But that was too tough, so he retreated to cellular or, and involved sort of many side issues besides the main technical, I mean, mathematical issue. At that time, DNA wasn't known, how, how actual organisms self-reproduce wasn't known. Very, it was all, uh, von Neumann anticipated a lot of that theoretically. And uh, the, uh, so, but, but his, his, and also von Neumann was, by training a mathematician, so he liked to have precisely defined <laughs> things that, that he could talk about. So he he'd invented, essentially invented cellular automata in the context of this problem and designed very specifically a kind of cellular automata. I think it had 57 internal states and very, very pre precise specifications of a cellular automata that, that could self-reproduce and also uh, in the right environment, construct arbitrary things. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he calls it a universal constructor. Actually, yeah. Okay, so I'm wondering about the the anions. I mean, yes. sometimes we think about them as sort of interpolating between fermions and bosons, yes. and you know. Well, that's a whole story that I didn't have time to well, go meant, into. But, but so, <laughs> bosons tend to bunch, fermions anti-bunch. Some have both Einstein distribution. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, Fermi Dirac yeah. distribution for fermions. Well, what about anions? Is that known? Well, kind of well, if the statistical mechanics of anions is in between, uh -huh. indeed, uh, I would say it's more like bosons. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, more like fermions. They tend to, they have angular momentum barriers which kind of make them repel each other just like. Uh, the fermions do because they 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 have to have odd angular momentum uh, or odd orbital. Well, anyway, they, so the, so they, uh, for instance, they that you can't have an anion condensate uh, 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 in any simple. You uh, well, you could have things like you have in superconductors. You make pairs of anions or triples of anions that then that that can condense, but not single ones. Uh, but the, the statistical mechanics of anions is actually not all that well understood. Only some very simple things have been calculated, and they do indeed turn out to be between bosons and fermions, but I, qualitatively, I think they're more like fermions. Yeah.